I wrote probably thousands of papers which I summarized into this text. I try to understand what is the meaning of living amongst others from an ethical perspective. And I was speaking on Jewish identity politics. Why did I pick on Jewish identity politics? Because I understand it, because I was raised in the Jewish state as a Jew. And I definitely regard for a very long time Israel as the biggest threat to world peace. But this week, especially, you, some of you would agree with me that it's not just Israel, it is also APAC. We leave all options on the table, and containment is definitely not an option. I try to understand what is it in this identity that became so powerful, why it is so westernized and empirical, and why it is hardly ethical and hardly immersed in em any emp empathic th thinking. I try to understand what is it about you Americans that makes, that allow, why? Why Americans allow such a lobby dominate your foreign policy? And I came up with some devastating answers. My writing are concerned with Jewishness, with this unique exceptionalist ideology that is based on Jewish chosenness. Chosenness. Now it is very interesting because everything that I say about Israel and Jewish identity politics can be applied to America. America is an exceptionalist place. Since that date, in 1945, the United States of America has bombed the following countries. China in 45 to 46, Korea in 50 to 53, China in 50 to 53, Guatemala in 54, Indonesia in 58, Cuba 59 and 60, Guatemala 60, Congo 1964, Peru 1965, Laos 1964 to 73, Vietnam 61 to 73, Cambodia 69 to 70, Guatemala 67 to 69, Grenada 83, Libya 86, El Salvador throughout the 80s, Nicaragua throughout the 80s, Panama 89, Iraq 91 to the present, Sudan 98, Afghanistan 98, Yugoslavia 99, and then Afghanistan and Iraq again. It's well between 12 and 15 million people directly killed by U.S. bombing, and they have the audacity to talk about terrorism? Everything that Israeli does, you do. And here there is something even slightly more worrying that everything that Israel does to the Palestinians you are actually doing now to your own people and this is why this society is so segregated and this is why you need 30,000 drones in the air this is a very good question your, 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 your society is in a pretty grave state. I and my administration have made the security of Israel a priority. It's why we've increased cooperation between our militaries to unprecedented levels. If I were a Jew, I'd be a Zionist. I am a Zionist. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist.
but there is something that you can clearly do in spite of the fact that this window is narrowing rapidly. I think that what makes America into a very interesting place is the First Amendment. This is probably the greatest thing you have, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that most of you realize that uh, there is not much left of your liberties. There is a serious assault on your freedom. However, we are still here and we are still talking freely. As it happened, this is your only chance. Now, how did they actually jeopardize your freedom? How do they do it? Do they do it through laws? Do they tell you it, is there a law that stops you from talking about 9-11? Not yet. Is there a law that stops you from talking about APAC or about Jewish power? No. Uh, not necessarily. Because what they did very successfully is pepper us with a mechanism that made us self-censoring ourselves. Most of us know what we are allowed to talk about and what we should never mention. Now, this is very clever, but it is also very dangerous to those lobbies that promote self-censorship. Let's talk about the Jewish lobby. By the way, you're not even allowed to say Jewish lobby. Here I'm saying it, Jewish lobby, you're a low camera, Jewish lobby. <laughs> so this is a kind of a liberating experience. Jewish lobby. <laughs> yeah, you have, to, you, have to learn, you have to learn how to pronounce the J. Because it is a Jewish lobby. It's not an Israeli lobby. And it doesn't even necessarily represent the Israeli interests. The Jewish lobby is a lobby of some, run by some very rich American Jews. It is not rep a representative of the Jewish community. It wasn't elected to represent the Jewish community, but it is a, a lobby that represents some very rich Jews that are basically looking after their own interests, own, own business interests, and Israel is just an instrument for them. We have to learn to criticize, to get over this political correctness issue, to really celebrate our freedoms. Why? Not just because we want to be free for real, because we are humanists, and because it is also very important that we do it for the Jews, for our Jewish brothers. Why? Because it is very clear that the Jewish American community cannot restrain APAC. And they definitely didn't manage to restrain their APACs in Weimar Republic in 1920s. The situation in Germany, in America today, is not different from the situation in late 1920s Germany. They bring a disaster a total disaster on themselves. If in 2003 it was clear to have some of us that the Jewish lobby and some Zionists within the administration were pushing for the war against Iraq because Iraq was the last uh, enemy of the, of the Jewish state in the region, it was so clear to us that it wasn't about WMD, it wasn't about oil, Check out the prices of oil so you know that I'm right. It was an attempt to destroy Iraq, which was basically, strategically, it was a very big mistake. Because now Iran is the, is, is the biggest, 
is the biggest power in the region. By the way, why was it a mistake? Because in Israel, you have some generals. You have some people who grow up like 30 years in the intelligence services before they become a decision makers. You even have maybe one or two clever politicians. I, I'm not sure about it in Israel. But in APAC, what the people in APAC know about intelligence, about tactical, about strategic thinking? In order to be in APAC, you know, you have to be a rich Jew. It means that you can basically sell toilet seats. And if you, and if you, and if you really want to get your toilet seats to be sold nationwide, <laughs> so you get to the higher league of APAC, and then you may be able to talk to the Congress. And the reason that you get into these dinners is because you say that you support Israel. I would be very insulted if I were American. <laughs> Just to tell them that he may not start a third world war on their behalf. If American people cannot say enough is enough, we want to talk about it, we don't like it, you have a big problem. But it's down to you. Ah, now everybody wants to talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, yeah. This is very simple to explain. Basically, every American political institute is competing on Israeli support. Why does it happen? It's very simple. Three decades ago, the Israeli, Israelis realized, or the lobby, or the supporters, that American politicians are much cheaper than tanks. So they don't have to buy tanks anymore because we have your sons and daughters fighting our wars. Israel made false flag attacks into an art form. Israel, Israeli history is saturated with false flag attack. The case of uh, Israelis operating in Egypt it was an affair in the 1950s. Israelis planting bombs, not Israeli, sorry, Jewish, uh, uh, Egyptian Jews, planting, uh, but operating within the Mossad, with the Mossad, planting bombs in American cinemas in Cairo. Uh, trying to create the impression of uh, anti-American feeling and so on. Israelis are very proud of being so clever. They like it. It's not a problem. It means what is the what is the uh, what is the motto? What is the motto of the Mossad? Do you, do you, do you know? By way of deception. Thou shalt uh, do, can you think of any other uh, official, uh, worldwide official institution that is w proudly uh, claiming to, to work by way of deception? I'm sure that the CIA is doing it, is doing it, but they wouldn't put it on the, as the motto. This is the motto of. No, the CIA says, "Seek ye the truth, and the truth shall make ye free." That's exactly. <laughs> There is definitely something in the Jewish culture and the way the Jews interpret, the Israelis interpret their ethical code or the, the moral of the Bible. And by the way, by way of deception, it's taken from the Bible. If you want to understand why the Jewish lobby dominating your 
foreign policy is because you practice as a society exceptionalism maybe since Versailles um, a, a agreement 1917 so it's like for 80 years or whatever and we the Jews work on it for 2,500 years so we are really good at it so if you really want to push your exceptional uh, ideology sense of victimhood uh, righteousness and the right to kill in the name of the righteousness take us we will run your think tank we are the neoconservatives but obviously there is a kind of a very vicious bond between these two cultures. I'm not against tribalism. I'm not against patriotism. I'm not against nationalism. Nationalism, patriotism, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to love your land. Look at the place where you're living, you know? I came today, it's like, wow. It's like the Sea of Galilee, but with no, uh, no. It's beautiful, but the problem starts when you celebrate your symptoms on the expense of others. And this is typical, this is typical to Jewish culture. Why? Because it's imbued with chosenness. But it is absolutely symptomatic to American culture as well. You know, you don't have a problem if to, to take another country just to take some, the, their assets, their oil, and so on. Another point that you are raising that is very similar between the two cultures, you know some people after going through an, a traumatic event suffer from post-traumatic stress. When it comes to Jewish culture we are dealing with pre-traumatic stress. They <laughs> invent a phantasmic scenario like now with Iran. Oi, the Iranian, they have this atomic bomb. We will put the United Nations on trial. We will put the International Court of Justice on trial. We will put the International Criminal Court on trial. We will give them the evidence and we will challenge them to justice or stop pretending that you are courts of law or institutions of justice. If the world community allows this man, this Hitler of the 21st century, who is currently without the means to bring about Hitler's result, but is in the process of trying to develop those means, if the international community rejects the evidence against this man, they will have been found guilty in the court of public opinion. Who used the mysterious September 11th incident as a pretext to attack Afghanistan and Iraq, killing, injuring, and displacing millions in two countries with the ultimate goal of bringing into its domination the Middle East and its oil resources. If that's not an incitement to genocide, I don't know what is. And they're shouting, there is a tantrum. It's in the dark, it's always a... And the meaning of it, it's a phantasmic scenario because the Iranians don't have an atomic bomb and by the way, this is a big problem. I would really love Iran to have an atomic bomb tonight because I can promise you that this would cool the Israeli down and the American, there was nothing. It's called power of deterrence. This would make the Israelis into a peace-seeking nation. So the Israelis definitely inventing this scenario and then they operating according to their fantastic, fantastic scenario. This is something that happens all the time in the Jewish history. <laughs> Less than two, actually. According to my knowledge, there are 1.9% of the population. They've even the fact that you thought that there are 10% is very symbolic. They are, one, less than, uh, they are around 1.9, but in this country, a very small, and by the way, they are 1.9, but then 
probably 99% of the Jews also have nothing to do with it. You know, we are talking about a very small community within the Jewish community that is set to serve its interests. When I'm talking about the similarities between Weimar Republic and America today, I'm basically talking about a very small community that manages to take over a country. and actually bring a disaster on its own community. And uh, by, the way, by the way, Germany was also destroyed. But German Jewry was destroyed. And, Ge and Germany itself was destroyed. So by acting now, you may be able to save yourself and your Jewish brothers. Now, what really happens? We clearly see people who act in the name of the Jews, which is typical to Jewish discourse. Israel defines itself as a Jewish state. It commits all these crimes in the names of the Jews. If there are Jews in this room, yes, are, are you, you know, uh, you know uh, do you feel that Israel is acting on your behalf? Obviously. Israel wasn't elected by the Jews to act as it acts. And yet, there is another problem. Though we see some sporadic Jewish dissent voices, it is very clear that the Jews as a community cannot restrain it's belligerent lobbies. Because Jews, as a community, have a very unique way to dismiss dissent. There was a guy, you heard about him, his name was Jesus. He had a slight problem <laughs> with his brothers. He, he thought that they should universalize their life to, to, to their brothers. He said, we are all brothers. He said, we are all brothers. They said, no, 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 back, 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 back. They finished him off. There is never, there is never any form of dissent allowed within this culture, which means that they are not going to save themselves. Now, frighteningly enough, there is some Jewish descent. We have Jews for peace, Jews for that, Jews for Moshe, Jews for Chaim, Jews for Yosef, Jews against APAC. What these Jews are doing? Do they really care about Palestine? Maybe, but I don't, I'm not so sure. I actually don't think so. What they try to do is to present a pluralist Jewish voice so we think that the Jews are nice and everything is fine and they actually, actually there was now Occupy APAC. The people who run it were actually righteous Jews. But they were very clever in vetting the discourse. So there was one very important seminar there with Alison Weir. And Jeff Blankfort. So I thought, wow, this is good. But then I found out uh, two days later 
that this wasn't part of Occupy APAC, it was actually put by Washington Report. We have to be sophisticated. Now, they are very, very sophisticated. Why they're very, very sophisticated? Because you are really newborn in this discourse. They practice it for 2,500 years. This is something that most people don't know. Judaism was born in Babylon. Judaism as we know it was born in Babylon. It was born in circumstances that were very similar to the moment of creation of Zionism. Babylon was a very easy, uh, uh, ex a very easy exile, total assimilation, and the Jews, some Jews, rabbis or whatever, are afraid of the Jewish identity evaporating. And they invent this exilic identity, which is a complete fuck up. <laughs> Why? Because the Jews, every religion, Muslims, Christian, Buddha, Buddha, whatever, people are connected always, try to find a bond with their land, with nature, with the people around them. No. If you are a Jew, you are connected with a different place and different time. All right? So this is, this is very important for you to understand what I'm saying now. It is an exilic religion that evolved into an exilic identity. They are always connected to a different place, to a different... This is why when they manage eventually, they always want to come to Jerusalem, and then they come to Jerusalem and they don't know what to do with it. Because they are used to be connected with, uh, from afar. They come to Jerusalem with Zionism. The old dream is to be part of the land, to be open, you know, to live in the open space. And what they do after 60 years, they build a humongous ghetto wall, like in Europe. If you want to understand what APAC is doing, you have to internalize this issue of exilic identity. Every migrant lobby, when I, t I sometime I, in my uh, <laughs> career of being a revolutionary, uh, whatever, self-hating Jew, uh, a proud self-hating Jew, <laughs> I, uh, met, I, I, I met quite a few uh, um, American politician, congressmen, and they always come with the same lame argument. We are an open, open culture, you know, we have lobbies, you know, why the Palestinians don't lobby? Every foreign lobby in this country, in Britain, in the West, is engaged with the interests of its respective migrant population. So if you, if you have a Pakistani lobby, they will look into halal food. Uh, unifying uh, families, uh, immigration issues, education, in the people here. But the Jewish lobby doesn't look at all it after the interest of the Jews. They look for another country. This means that there will never be any other lobby competing with APAC except another Jewish lobby. And this is exactly what we have. The only lobby that competes with APAC is J Street. What is the meaning of it? We have APAC taking care of 80 funding, 80% 80 of your elected politicians countrywide. And then we have another lobby that is also ultra-Zionist and they <laughs> fund the rest 20%, and in general, 100% of your elected politicians are funded by a foreign agency. Some of us are familiar with the work of Israel Shahak on the Talmud. There are some el devastating elements in the Talmud. Do you know the Talmud? Jews don't know the Talmud. So what we, have, what we see in the process of secularization 
In the process of secularization, we managed to transform the Talmud into a very brutal, chauvinist, racist philosophy. They really managed to pick from the Talmud the most devastating ideas, sometimes even hatred toward Goim. And this is indeed uh, reflected in, the Israel, in Israeli politics, the way they treat Palestinians and so on. And uh, when you look at APAC, at the dismissal of human life in general. So I'm split here between agreeing that they don't know the Talmud, but something from the Talmud definitely filtered into the culture. There are two questions here. First, it's not just Holocaust denial. I'm blamed for being an anti-Semite, Holocaust denier, and a self-hating Jew. I'm not an anti-Semite because I really hate everybody equally. <laughs> I'm not an anti-Semite because there is no such a thing as anti-Semite. Jews are not Semitic. They blame people for being an anti-Semite because by blaming people for being anti-Semite, they reassure the fantasy of themselves being from, coming from the region. And they are not from the region, and they have never, never been from the region. The only people from the, only people from the region, the re original Jews, are the Palestinians themselves. And more than that, why is it so offensive that when you call someone uh, anti-Semite? Because you blame someone for being racist. And Jews are not a race. They behave as racist, as a collective, but they're not a race. Self-hating Jew. I'm not a self-hating Jew. I'm a proud self-hating Jew. <laughs> when you criticize Israel, you are blamed for being a self-hating. And my initial, my, initial, my, my initial instinct was to say, hey, I, I, I don't hate, hate me, I hate you. Which is a good answer. It's funny. But I really don't want to engage in politics of hatred. I learned from one of my philosophical mentors, Otto Weininger, very clever insight he came up with. He says, the scientists look at the world and he manages to come with some general observations. The artist, I'm an artist, looks in the mirror, looks inside himself or herself, and manages to come with observation about the world. I basically learn a lot about Jewishness, Judaism, looking into myself. So, I really don't like the Jew in me, but the question is, why, why is it that when I hate myself, so many Jews are offended? <laughs> it's an interesting question. And now, Holocaust denial. Oi, my favorite <laughs> subject. Yeah, listen, I'm playing in Germany, Austria, France, on a weekly basis. My book coming now in France uh, this week, it comes in Germany in two, two, three months. If I'm a Holocaust denier, take me. In, they're very strict about it. I argue openly that if Jews want really to move forward, they must look into their history. They must look in the mirror. And this is clearly something that they don't manage to do as a collective. I argue that if Jews want to understand the Holocaust not as a religious narrative, as a historical chapter that, um, uh, that is a meaningful event, they have to understand the circumstances that led to their destruction.
if Jews as a collective are empathic human beings, they should ask themselves, how did we manage to get the Germans and the French and the Ukrainians to hate us so much? To feel a bit guilty about it. This is the first time that I'm saying it in public. How is it that we came to Palestine, we, we promised all our brothers in the diaspora, Jews, to come to bring to life the new civilized Jew, and check out how much these people hate us. What, what is it about us? How can one avoid this question? I, for instance, know very well, and we spoke about it today in the radio, why Zionists and Jewish anti-Zionists hate me so much. I know exactly what I'm doing that they don't like. Isn't it about time that the Jewish, Jews as a collective ask exactly the same question, or Jewish historians ask the same question? For asking, for raising these issues, and I address it in the book, and you better buy the book because I had a cat catastrophe and I have too many books. Yeah. Buy four or five. If you buy 1,000, we give you a good price. And you see, I'm, I'm, I'm from the tribe. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I really mean it. It's not a joke. A really good price for 1,000 copies. Uh, um, for raising these questions, I'm called a Holocaust denier. And you know what? It was very hurtful for many years to see myself defamed and smeared and dragged into this crap. I don't know what happened, but in the last year, I really learned to enjoy it. So when I saw last week a group of 17 uh, 17 Jews, Marxist, anarchist, hey, hey, red Jews defaming me with, uh, with uh, another uh, um, 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 Arab, angry Arab, Arab collaborator, who, by the way, was the first to attack Mersheimer and Walt for, their, for, for writing about the Jewish lobby. So when I see these people attacking me, I say, this is exactly what I write about in the book. There is a very dangerous continuum between hardcore Zionism, Jewish anti-Zionism, and some element within the left. It is, definitely, it is definitely a forged document, but, <laughs> but, the, the, but APAC is a mainstream news. Who needs the protocols of the <laughs> elders of silly Zion? Who needs it? You know, you open CNN, and you see your, your, your president, you know. The bonds between the United States and Israel are unbreakable. And the commitment of the United States to the security of Israel is ironclad. We don't need the protocols of the elders of Zion. What we see now is very interesting with APAC. Because until now, they really tried to control, to dominate uh, American politics and to do it behind the scene. Now it's totally open and they're pushing for a world war. We're making our most advanced technologies available to our Israeli allies. Even the Israelis are not, the Israeli people are dismissed by the Israeli government. Now this is why we saw this uh, Israeli uh, 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 uprise in the summer because they don't have any place to live in. But 30% of Tel Aviv flats are empty. Why they're empty? Because they were bought along the years by rich Jews. American, French, British. Why? Because they need the Holocaust shelter. But what kind of people need Holocaust shelter? Do you have Jim? Do you have a Holocaust shelter? <laughs> Do you have a Holocaust shelter? 
What kind of people need Holocaust shelter? People who know that they may bring a show on themselves. The Balfour Declaration was a 1917 declaration by Lord Balfour, British, who promised the Jews national home in Palestine, on the expense of the Palestinians. And we never learned in Israel what happened there. Why? Why the British decided to give a national home to the Jews? When we asked, they came up with a very simple answer. There was a guy, Chaim Weizmann, who later became the first uh, uh, Israeli president. He was uh, a very important scientist, helped the British war effort, and they really wanted to give him presents. This is a beautiful story, beautiful Jewish uh, uh, story. You see, we are so clever, they don't know how to save them. We save them. No, British don't give a state to scientists. They may give them a castle in Scotland. <laughs> All right? Nonsense. Crap. Only when, maybe six, seven years ago, I learned from actually an Israeli author, Amos Elon. I really highly recommend this book about the German Jewry if you want to understand what was going on there. Uh, it's called The Pity of It All. Apparently, the British government realized that they were not going to win the war. It was very clear in 1917. Unless the American join in. They don't know what to do. And because apparently the British ambassador in Washington writes, the, writes a, a, a telegram saying, sorry guys, there is a Jewish conspiracy against us in America. What was the conspiracy? Very simple. American bankers, the people who support, supposed to support the war, to finance it, are largely German Jews and some are Russian Jews. German Jews are the most patriotic Germans in the history of, German, of Germany. Russian Jews also loved the Germans because the Germans were fighting the Tsar and the Tsar was an anti-Semite. The meaning of it was very simple and this is the story. They didn't give money. Lord Balfour was very clever. He tried. He gave them a promised land. He promised them a land in the most beloved place on this planet for Jews, in Zion. Two months later, America was in the war. Now, is it really that German Jews betrayed Germany? No. German Jews were fighting the First World War as Germans till the end of the war. They didn't even know what was happening there. It was a few, just a very few. It's a kind of a one uh, bunker called Kuhn. And when I say the Jews should look in the mirror and look into the circumstances of their history, this is exactly what I want them to look at. In 100 years, Jews will have to look into the, what APAC did this week. It's very hard for them. Israel is one state. It has a natural border, sea, river, mountain, desert. It has one electric grid, one sewage system. It is it, is, uh, it has even uh, one international area code, 972. But Israel is dominated, it is a one state that is dominated by moronic, racist, tribalist ideology, i.e. Jewish ideology. It is the Jewish state. This implies 
that Palestinians are not second-rate citizens because they have other discriminated Jews before them. The Russian Jews, the Ethiopian Jews, the Sephardi Jews, the Arab Jews, there are something like seven or eight great citizens. The issue, this conflict could have been resolved in just two minutes. All it would take for Benjamin Netanyahu or any other Israeli prime minister to stand up and say, hello everybody, I realize what is going on. It's pretty simple actually. We are two people, we both fight on the same land. We kicked quite a few Palestinians. We have now six million, seven million actually, Palestinian refugees. Everyone who wants to come back, Salam Aleikum, Yalla, <laughs> come. This would mean that Israel, the Jewish state, for the first time in its life, in its short life, managed to establish a real, peaceful understanding and move toward reconciliation. Not just with the Palestinians. This, is, this would make Jews live in peace with their history, with their history of segregation. It is, would be a resolution. And it would even fulfill the Zionist dream. Here we live on our land in peace. Now, I'm not stupid. It's not going to happen. Why it would never happen? For it to happen, they must be de-Zionized first. And they are not going to do it voluntarily. But they are not alone. It is clear that the Jewish state can never lead to, uh, to uh, a peaceful reconciliation. But they're not alone. You know Israel has many bombs, atomic, nuclear, uh, atomic, chemical, biological. The Palestinians have one bomb, demographic bomb. The Palestinians are largely Muslims and Christians. In Islam and in Christianity, we have a very healthy notion of peace, reconciliation, brotherhood. In fact, Jews were living in the last 1400 years, till the beginning of, till the Zionism came along, in Arab countries and were protected. They never had any problem in Islamic world. If anything, it is Palestinians who can lead this reconciliation, but the Palestinians cannot lead this reconciliation where they are occupied. But there is another positive news. When Israelis want to feel authentic, when they want to feel part of the land, they eat hummus, falafel, and they swear in Arabic. Israelis will eventually understand. They will be defeated by hummus, by the sky, by the soil, to understand that this, not by politicians, not by American administration, that will bring peace. You cannot bring peace to the region. But the Israelis, when they want to be authentic, they want to eat hummus. And they will have to eat hummus with the Palestinians, and eventually they will even learn to share the pita. They will be defeated into peace. There is no any other way around it. And I'm pretty optimistic.